their faces and say, since I've been uh, doing these Zoom classes for the Crocker, a couple of them right in a row, so I'm actually starting to recognize some faces and names. So I'm glad some of you are willing to put up with me um, again. And then for those of you that haven't had me before, it's really nice to see you. Um, uh, as Emma said, I teach a lot of different classes um, at the Crocker. I've done kids and adult classes there, um, and then also at Sac State in Sierra. But really, one of my favorite things to teach is Native American art, particularly contemporary Native American art as well. So this was one that we set up a long time ago, and I was really excited to do. Um, uh, I know that I'm actually working with some students in Davis right now on doing a land acknowledgement, so I won't do the formal Crocker land acknowledgement, but since we are talking about a Native American artist, I thought it would be appropriate to put in um, Joan Quick to see Smith's map of all of the different tribes that make up North America and just say that we are uh, actually, I am on Patwin land because I'm in Davis. The Crocker of course is on Maidu land with Miwok and Wintoon close by. Um, so just wanted to acknowledge that. And that's what Joan Quick to see Smith does in this one. If you're, if it looks a little bit familiar it's because it is very familiar to the, the, um, the Browning of America work that the Crocker has by Quick to See Smith as well. And um, if you're ever interested in looking at uh, the indigenous land of exactly where you are, one of the new tools that has come up in just the last few years or so is um, this website that you can see down below. It's an interactive map of all indigenous land. So you can essentially just put in a zip code and find out who once lived there, which is kind of fun to, to see too. So um, now I will move on to Wendy Redstar. Now, Wendy Redstar is a great artist to talk about. I have to say she is probably one of the favorite artists of my students. Um, and you'll probably see for, a, 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 as you'll see, I think for a variety of reasons. Um, I, when I was talking to um, Emma, uh, we were, she's definitely somebody to know in terms of this series because she is so prolific and quite young. Um, I can't do the math immediately, but she was born in 1981. So what does that make her? Something like 41 years old. So she's still, it's amazing to think of how much work she has already done. Um, and this is just one of her most latest, uh, one of her latest series is this echo that you can see here. Kind of, I thought I'd bring it in as a self-portrait and we'll talk about the quote in just a second. Um, but one of the reasons I think of her as being such a good artist to know is because she covers so much of the themes in contemporary art and especially indigenous contemporary art in, you know, a fairly short career so far, um, as we're going to see, you can write down as I'm talking throughout the next couple uh, next two hours, um, if there are any other themes that you see crop up. But as I was thinking about the body of her work, she really covers almost everything that you see that's critical to kind of understanding indigenous art today, including this idea of revising history, kind of uh, teaching us new aspects or giving a native viewpoint to history, dealing with the idea of stereotypes and native American identity, also working with gender identity, um, touching on colonization and kind of continuing in that process of what's called decolonization today, which is just that idea of revising history and stereotypes, basically. She also has work that talks about the role of museums in colonization, works closely with museums to kind of decolonize them. Um, in terms of sovereignty, she also kind of talks about these issues of ownership, cultural reclamation. Um, we even see her dealing with food justice, which especially in the Central Valley is a big, you know, because there's, we have so many crops around here and the whole farm to, food, fork, farm to fork movement. Food justice, as we're gonna see, is something that she touches on. And then I put humor in um, all caps just because uh, that is definitely something that you see a lot of contemporary Native artists do. Um, and you'll see that with her work as well. And as one kind of contemporary writer put it, you know, uh, it, you know, to deal with so much tragedy, you kind of have to deal with humor. And so that's one of the reasons you see humor as such an important part of a lot of contemporary Native artists. Um, some of you guys might be familiar with Harry Fonseca another kind of local hero who definitely uses humor as well. 
So not only does she cover like the whole swath of uh, those critical issues. She also, I mean, she really is kind of amazing. Uh, she covers like the whole swath of different types of media. So as it took me a while to make up all of these lists, we think of her mainly as a photographer, but she got her master's in sculpture actually. She also does performance, installation, what? video, multimedia, interestingly enough, she thinks of herself primarily as a fiber artist, just because kind of those beading and sewing traditions are so much a fabric of her own Native American culture. And then one of the reasons my students love her is because she is such a master at digital media and especially social media too. So like I said, she really does cover the entire gamut of uh, kind of postmodern arts as well. So definitely, I think looking at her, you can learn a lot about Native American culture as a whole, and then also a lot about different kind of postmodern strategies as well. When I talk about contemporary Native American art with my students, again, it's like any kind of postmodern art. If any of you guys are familiar with, you know, postmodern art, especially kind of the wide range of postmodern artists that the Crocker has, there's so much to kind of deal with. Um, so it's kind of a little bit like a smorgasbord. You kind of pick and choose what you like. But I have found over time there are some kind of general themes that it's kind of helpful to think about, especially when you're looking at different contemporary Native artists. So I kind of divide them up into the modern and the postmodern with the idea of the storytellers being the modernists, um, another local kind of hero, Frank LaPena, who kind of started the Native American Studies Department at Sac State. It was really so instrumental in kind of the, 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 the formation of contemporary Native art in California. Um, that's his work that you see on the right that was kind of uh, one of the major works that um, when I remember I see read the exhibit that Crocker had a few years ago that he organized just before his death basically. Um, so he's a good example of a storyteller because he uses kind of a modern style and like some of the other ones Alan Hauser, Joe Herrera, Oscar Howe, Robert Davidson up on the Northwest Coast, they still are very involved in their own cultural traditions and they often share parts of those in their work. Um, but today, and, and there's still certainly very valid artists that are working in that kind of vein today, but I like to think of the postmodernists, many of whom are working today um, as tricksters because they are the ones that kind of push back. They use humor, they use critique to kind of deconstruct some of these ideas about the Indian, about the Indian artist, about the museum. Um, and they uh, use a lot of new strategies like photographs, text, multimedia. So definitely Wendy Red Star is in that second camp of kind of being a postmodern trickster. Um, and so, you know, she's following in a long tradition of those types of artists, particularly since the 1960s and 70s. And again, you have, um, you're, you're you looking at some of the slides I use with my own students that I thought might be helpful, but it's really in the 1960s and 70s that you see postmodern, um, uh, native art kind of take off just because uh, they be, they're they more in the public eye um, with the Voting Rights, Act, with, uh, Voting Rights Act, with the beginnings of the American Indian Movement and the occupation of Alcatraz here in California, um, the occupation of Wounded Knee a little bit later. You see all of, in, in all of these ways, you start to see kind of contemporary native groups enter the popular consciousness. So it's interesting when you look at that second set of dates, it's at exactly the same time that you start to see Native American art and contemporary Native American artists enter museum collections as well. So it kind of goes hand in hand. And so Wendy Red Star and we are kind of living um, as a benefit of that. Another term that I use with all of my native artists, whether they are from the 1800s <clears throat> or contemporary artists is a term called survivance. Um, because I think that part of the issue for many Native American artists and Native American culture as a whole was this idea of being frozen in time 
kind of stuck with very specific ideas about what constitutes what constitutes tradition or culture or authenticity, when in fact, when you look closely at any indigenous culture, they survive through adaptation, basically, and through these very different and evolving forms. And so that too is an idea that uh, originates with a Native American writer named Gerald Visnor that also I think is very important to think about when looking at Native American artists. Part of what you see today is artists choosing, picking and choosing how they want to express their culture as an assertion of kind of, let's say their individual sovereignty. There's no one way to do it. Um, but again, what I think is really interesting about Wendy Red Star is she is able to, um, touch upon all of these kind of very universal themes, um, but always referencing her own specific culture. Um, in many cases, when you look at different contemporary Native artists, you'll see them working on these very universal themes, um, but you don't really get a sense of learning about their own distinct culture because they're kind of looking on a more global view, or you see a lot of artists that will be very specific about their own individual culture and they don't necessarily touch on a lot of these global themes. Again, I think Wendy Red Star um, is able to kind of cross those boundaries in very, very interesting ways. Um, she actually, as I said, was born in 1981 in Billings, Montana. Um, uh, she is part of, and you'll see the spelling for Absaluka, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, or Crow Nation. Um, her father was Absoluka Crow. Her mother was Anglo, but working in the Indian Health Service at the time. Um, and so she was born. Um, eventually, her parents divorced, um, but she was raised much of the time. Um, she was raised adjacent to and on the Crow Reservation, which is in Yellowstone Valley. Um, I was checking to see if Wendy Red Star had any comments about the Yellowstone TV series. I was at Target the other day and they actually have um, merchandise for that Yellowstone show. I haven't seen that she brought up anything, but what we're talking about is that same exact area where uh, the Crow have lived there for thousands and thousands of years. Um, in fact, one of the points she brings up is that when they had the Land Allotment Act, we'll be talking about it a little bit later, their 38 million acres were reduced to 2.3 million acres. So they've lost um, almost 94% of their land. And so Yellowstone Park, Billings, all of those areas are on formerly Crow um, Absoluca land as well. Currently today, there's roughly 11,000 Crow that are kind of uh, registered. And um, interestingly enough, but you see this with many different Native American groups, about 75% of them still live on or near the reservation. And that, again, is something you see in most indigenous groups, the importance of the land in the community and um, many members will stay very close by. Um, this is the slide that I use with my students to just give kind of a general overview of Plains culture. So keep in mind when we're talking about the Plains as a cultural area, that's a huge span of uh, uh, geography basically from the Mississippis to the Rockies um, and with a lot of, of course, very distinct cultural traditions each group with a distinct language. And many of these languages come from essentially totally different language groups or stocks. So completely different from each other. Um, but at the same time, there are some general themes that you see all throughout the plains in, in terms of their kind of traditional life ways. One of which was the centrality of the Buffalo, the hunting of the Buffalo and kind of the Buffalo as a very important cultural source that you see. Um, uh, the groups themselves were not nomadic as in constantly moving, but really semi-nomadic like most California groups too, <clears throat> in terms of maybe having several different camps all throughout the year. So they're not even moving like every month, but like a couple times a year, um, either uh, seasonally in terms of gathering of certain items or during the hunting season. Um, and definitely 
all plains cultures were completely transformed with the introduction of the horse um, coming up from Mexico after the arrival of the Spaniards. So those are kind of some of the major themes that you see, particularly with the crow. The crow, for example, or absoluca, I should say, which is the name they prefer, um, is a matrilineal society. So we'll go back to that as well. Um, and though it's a matrilineal society in which descent follows the mother, the individual warrior or hunter still plays a very important public role. And so when you look at a lot of their cultural productions, many of them are kind of um, narratives of their exploits, of those warriors and hunters' exploits, not just as a means of bragging, but really when you look at it as a form of personal protection as well. So when you look at this uh, portrait of a Mandan chief, which is right next door, uh, uh, just a little bit further north in the Absoluca, uh, Matotope, this is probably one of the most famous images of a Plains chief. We tend to think about it as Indians with headdresses, and we don't realize that everything that he is wearing has its own specific language and conveyed to members of, of his community his exploits from the amount of horses he had captured from an enemy to the amount of times he had counted coup upon an enemy. So if you're not familiar with the idea of counting coup or the coup stick that you see spelled there, that's that large staff that Mato Tope is, wearing, is, is holding there. And um, in Plains culture, for the most part, the highest honor of any warrior would be not to kill an enemy in battle, but to take that coup stick and to touch an enemy and retreat without being injured. So that was kind of really the highest status that you could attain. Um, and so that's why you'll often see many of these warriors um, kind of shown with that. And in many cases, when we say chief, we think there's one individual leader in a group, and that's why you see that name chief. Um, but in fact, you had a series of elders. It was a much more, let's say, democratic kind of institute society than you might see. Um, in addition to the feather headdress and the other kind of headdress, the coup stick, all of the clothing and their accessories also were intended as a form of personal protection. Um, and that protection was afforded by images of their victories and their visions. So when you look at the buffalo robe that you see in the center, that's the one that was actually owned mm -hmm. by Mato Tope. And what you actually see is all of his different exploits that were placed, painted by him on his buffalo robe that he would kind of wear for warmth. Um, so automatically in our Western society, we kind of think of that as a means of kind of showing off your skill, which it was in a way, but it was more important as a form of personal protection. Those designs were not worn on the outside for somebody to see, they were worn on the inside closest to the wear for the most part. The outside would have been the buffalo fur, which would have been what was kind of keeping them warm. On the left, you actually have Mato Tope's sh um, shield. Shields too were another means of showing exploits and then sometimes images that might appear in dreams like vision helpers. So those two were placed on the shields as a form of personal protection. Um, so much so that many times the warriors would take just the shield cover with the images out into the battle rather than having the buffalo hump, which was much more bulky but actually much more protective. They sometimes, if they had to choose between one or the other, would choose the symbolic protection over the physical protection. So it's really interesting to look at Plains culture just in terms of that language. When you look at some of these shields, for example, that you see here, the one on the right possibly being from Crazy Horse, you can see these different images for protection, whether it is the mother bear and kind of the uh, ferocity of a mother bear kind of get, uh, protecting her young or uh, a, a victory over uh, a settler. You can see that here with the black brimmed hat and the um, rifle. And then other images, whether it's a bear that you can see on that top, the thunderbird that you can see on the bottom, or dragonflies, which were very swift and agile when they were flying. Those two were images that you would see for protection. Same thing for the men's shirts as well. Um, different kind of designs would be used as a form of protection. 
And then other things would be added on for my students. I just call them additives. It could be different feathers that might be used as a form of protection beaks of birds, and then hair locks, which is what you see here. Um, this is a shirt that's been identified as kind of coming from one of these three communities, whether it's the Absaluka, the Arapaho, or the Cheyenne. Um, and again, when we look at this, we automatically think scalping, because that's kind of our idea of having these hair locks. But if you think about it, all of these hair locks are dark. Um, and it's because they're not meant to represent the enemies that are slain. It's the family members that this particular leader was responsible for. So as a means of showing kind of status, um, a warrior would have the hair locks of all of his loved ones placed on his shirt, both as a form of protection in battle and as a statement of all of those people that he was responsible for. So when you're looking at a shirt like this, you're seeing somebody that was kind of very highly respected and had a lot of people that he was responsible for, a patriarch, for example. And that's kind of what you see with all of these other ones, sometimes kind of, as I said, battles, like you can see this one here that were used as a form of protection. Sometimes the red and white stripes of the American flag, feathers, hair locks. Here is kind of a quilled image of the Thunderbird that you see as well. So a lot of different designs that you see. So when we start to look at, uh, I didn't forget that we're supposed to be talking about Wendy Redstar. When we start to look at Wendy Redstar's work, what she really does is she pushes back. Um, she, uh, she pushes back on those cultural stereotypes and she really tries to educate and learn, educate herself and others about many of these life ways. And one of the things she sa has said repeatedly in many of the different interviews that I looked at is, when she was growing up in school, kind of on or near the reservation, even in, it was actually, let me backtrack. When she was growing up in school, in the public school system, even in or around the uh, reservation, she did not learn anything at all about her culture. That was only learned from her family, basically. Um, and so she said she didn't learn anything about her uh, culture kind of specifically until she took Native American studies classes at University of Montana in Billings. And that's really where she starts getting activated as an artist. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, in one of her interviews, she talked about the fact that one of her first works was as she was going around campus in, in Billings, she started to put teepees up on campus in various places to kind of acknowledge the fact that that was formerly part of Absaluka land. Um, and she got annoyed because those lodge poles kept on getting kicked down by people that were walking around. And so she finally erected a series of five teepees on the 50 yard line of the football field. And that's when they kind of had to uh, take notice of her work. So I thought that was really interesting. I'm sorry I could not find any photos of that. That would have been an interesting one to look at. But that's where that quote comes from the beginning when she said, you know, people think of my work as political, but I don't think of it as political. It's just a fact. It's just a fact that that was originally land. And so she's kind of, that was her effort to kind of reclaim it. After graduating from the University of Montana, she went on to UCLA. I was really surprised to see that she got her MFA in sculpture, not photography. So she graduated in 2006. So a couple interesting points about that fact. Um, first of all, she talked about the fact that she was not a very good student there. I thought that was really interesting because so many times very poor students decide in the end, or I shouldn't say decide, eventually they evolved into being very good teachers. And she's really kind of taught at different universities across the country at this point as a visiting lecturer and a full-time lecturer up in Portland for a period of time. So that's one interesting point about it. Second is that um, I really haven't seen too many of her sculptures from her early years. And then the third point is this is done the year after she uh, graduated. Actually, I should say she graduates from UCLA in 2006. And this is one of the series that she's most well known for. So again, it's really kind of an impressive fact. You know, I've dealt with a lot of artists. You very rarely see their seminal work done kind of immediately upon graduation from graduate school. So she starts out kind of right out of the gate, I think. 
in this series that she did, which is um, actually the, the autumn, the fall was actually shown at the Crocker as well. Um, but the series that she did as she talks about it, she uh, was, uh, you know, went to a natural history museum. Um, she liked to go to museums. And one of the threads that you see in her work is her very assiduous research. Um, if she's working at a museum, she does research into their collections. She did research on ancestry.com about her family. So she's always looking into past history. And she said she went into a museum in California and she did, doesn't, doesn't mention which one. And she was kind of offended at the way that the natives were displayed. So I would assume it would be California Native, she said she felt like they were in a diorama. And so that her response and reaction to that was to create this series of portraits based on kind of the seasonal idea of the Indian um, capitalizing on all of those different stereotypes. So she ordered these inflatable animal, animals and she sets herself up as an object in those dioramas. So she's really kind of speaking to the cultural stereotypes of the Indian, as well as the objectification of those individuals, particularly in museums, I have to say, um, which is kind of what you tend to see, you know, the de Young, I remember going to, um, uh, not the de Young, but the, the the California Academy of Sciences when I was young and seeing very similar types of dioramas. Um, Night at the Museum, the movie kind of pokes fun of Pocahontas kind of in these different dioramas. So it's certainly a part of kind of our, our shared experience. And that's exactly kind of what she means to poke fun of or critique. And she goes back and if you think about all of the different kind of popular images or stereotypes of the Indian, that's really what she's intending to critique. Um, the Land O'Lakes Butter um, just finally got pulled off the market last year. Um, that, that, that advertising logo basically existed till then. And then as we all know, the Cleveland, the Cleveland team, I shall say, is now the Warriors? No, they're not the Warriors anymore. Um, they're the Guardians at this point. And finally, the Washington team um, has a new name as well. I think the Commanders is it. Um, so some of these have kind of gone by the wayside, but you'd be surprised at how real many of them still are to a lot of people. So that's kind of, like I said, her response to that. And um, very similar to the work that you see of Cindy Sherman who's been doing it since the 1970s. She really spends, she positions herself as the subject in many of her works. And so that's kind of what you can see here in her traditional regalia um, that she made for powwows and dances. Um, and so you can see it there in winter. Um, this one, here we have spring kind of arrayed with all the blossoms, um, always with some kind of deer that you can see there in the background. Here is fall. And then let's see. Oh, I'm sorry, that one is summer. And then this one is fall that you can see here. Again, with much of the traditional re regalia, we'll talk about the dress in a second, but you can see the bags. Um, actually that design that you see on the bags, that kind of double triangle design is very typical of crow beading designs that you'll see too. So she's incorporating a lot of I don't want to say authenticity because that can be kind of a loaded term too, but kind of a lot of cultural truths for her in tandem with a lot of these kind of very clearly kind of fake ideas at the same time. So the Crocker, I believe, owns this one from 2006. Oh no, actually, I'll show you the one that the Crocker owns. It'll come up in a second. So in 2006, as I said, kind of right out of the gate, she's really kind of creating these works that um, really have so much resonance in so many ways. This one, particularly as we're in November, getting close to Thanksgiving. Actually, the first time I saw this work was at the Crocker when it was part of uh, one of the contemporary native exhibits a few years ago. This one too is from 2006, The Last Thanks. So it's meant to be a redo of those Thanksgiving feasts that children would do in school. I still have a picture of myself in a pilgrim's cap for my kindergarten Thanksgiving feast. Um, so she takes that idea 
and she kind of turns it on its head. So again, she positions herself in the center. And there's also been a lot of discussion of this work as really kind of borrowing from the ideas of the Last Supper from the biblical tradition as well. Um, but instead of having Indians in their construction paper feather headdresses that so many children have done over the years, she places those on skeletons, um, kind of going back to the idea that you have uh, roughly somewhere between a 90 to a 98% death rate after the arrival of Europeans on the North American continent, mainly to due to disease, um, but in addition to that, to land loss, uh, uh, violence, of course. And today, Native Americans, going back to this particular image, have one of the highest rates of diabetes um, in the country. Um, most indigenous peoples are much more susceptible to diabetes for two reasons. And then again, you see this across the world, not just with uh, Native Americans, but if you look at indigenous South Americans, um, oceanic cultures everywhere. Um, first reason it's thought is that it's because of such a quick change from a traditional indigenous diet to a Western diet. So that's one of the reasons that you see, that, or one of the, the theories that you see why Native Americans have such high rates of diabetes. The second is what you kind of see here. All of the cheap um, calorie carbohydrate laden food that was essentially forced on Native groups by government organizations from the earliest inception. So the foods that you see here, like the oatmeal cream pies and the margarine and the Wonder Bread, the bologna, those are the foods that Wendy Red Star remembers eating at her grandmother's house. If you visit a reservation today or a reservation store, you're gonna see food that is at crazy cheap prices. A loaf of bread for like 50 cents to a dollar. Um, so it's cheap food and it's readily available, but it has you know, devastating consequences on the health. In fact, I was teaching a contemporary Native American art class when this was exhibited and we walked through the ex exhibition and uh, one of the women that was in the class with me said that she had been, uh, she had some role working in the government and when they flew up to Alaska, <laughs> they would come with huge amounts of these really kind of cheap sugar carbohydrate laden food. Um, and that's the only food that was available for many of these different groups to eat. So again, the idea of food justice, um, being allowed to kind of uh, go back to kind of indigenous crops and, and, and a recognition of the role that the government played in kind of um, really forcing many of these foods on to many different native communities is something that she's bringing up in this one. I actually just one last final point about this one. Um, last year when I was doing my non-Western art class, I was teaching non-Western art um, or indigenous arts at Sierra last November. And then I was also teaching an upper division Native American art class. And I showed, I actually posted this as a kind of a Thanksgiving greeting for both of my classes. And when I got in a discussion with my, my Sac State class about it, they said, I don't know if this is such a nice Thanksgiving greeting for anybody. I was like, yeah, I guess, I guess so. But she makes some very important points. Um, now this is the work that's owned by the Crocker. So you'll see it on exhibit at various points. Um, really striking work. These are pretty large format photographs, sometimes two by three feet um, that she sells in editions of anywhere from 15 to 25. And this too has been one of her major statements as well. Um, she has the hashtag on Instagram, hashtag Absoluca Feminist. I looked, she hasn't added to it recently. I was checking it out this morning, but in this, it's a self-portrait this time of herself with her daughter, Beatrice, who you are going to become very familiar with because she seems to have been her uh, Wendy Wets Red Star's muse and partner in many of her works from kind of in the last 10 years or so. Apparently, um, uh, Beatrice kind of worked with her and kind of served as a model from about the time she was eight, seven um, to the time 
time she was about 11, sometimes even serving as a tour guide for some of her mother's gallery exhibitions. And she's now 13 and has opted out of participating and collaborated with her mother, like most adolescents do. Yeah. Definitely see her a little bit too. And um, what I really like about this one, why this makes such a great statement is it's an updated image of a Native American family um, Wendy Red Star and her daughter. Um, and you see them both again in very traditional dress and not just traditional dress, but the dress of somebody exactly. who is much loved, basically. So if you look closely at both of their dresses, they both have those same disc like decorations on them. Does anybody know what they are? Whale teeth. Buffalo yeah, teeth. Elk teeth. Yeah, somebody is familiar with it. Thank you. Yeah, they're elk teeth. So elk these teeth. are the types of dresses that historically were given uh, to young girls or women as a sign of love and dedication by a grandfather, a father, a uh, wow. Uh, uh, a husband in some cases, um, because it also has to do with the skill of that male in terms of hunting the elk. Mm -hmm. It's particularly important when you look at those dresses and you realize one elk has only two of those teeth. So when you're looking what? at an elk tooth dress like this, what you're looking at is a deposit of a huge amount of time and energy for the hunter, and therefore a huge amount of uh, you know love and dedication to the individual that's wearing it. Um, and this becomes kind of one of those iconic images, not just with the Absoluca, but with other plains groups. So you can really recognize it in different places. So you'll see several different images of these elk tooth dresses. Um, and in fact, I believe it's Wendy Red Star that helped make the one for her daughter Beatrice. And so you can see both of them there. So that's one thing that's really interesting to note about this one, just kind of that, that focus on the female arts. We talked about the men's arts first, and I kind of did that deliberately in terms of kind of um, the narrative arts that you see worn by the men. But what you see in any really indigenous culture is not that men are privileged over women, what you see is the complementary role in gender, of gender in most, in, in most indigenous groups. And if you think about any of those men's items that we looked at, particularly the buffalo robe and especially the shirt, those are only done in collaboration with women. And so increasingly there's a recognition that um, it's really only through women's arts that men's prowess could essentially be displayed as well. And then, then if you look at the background of this work as well, you can see it's kind of a digitized background, but it's meant to honor those women's arts in terms of different types of crow beating program, uh, beating patterns that you see there. So uh, this is uh, Wendy Red Star's grandmother, um, from whom, as you can see from this quote, she learned a great deal. Um, and again, remember I said, she kind of considers herself a textile artist uh, as one of the most important kind of, one of her most important roles. And I would guess that it partly has to do with the uh, role that her grandmother took in her life. And so this is a photograph of her grandmother. And if you look at her dress, you can see that she too is wearing an elk, truth, elk tooth dress there. And then here is another elk tooth dress that you can see from the Cheyenne group on the left. They almost look like this real kind of ivory like luster when you look at them. Um, and so even if women's arts didn't have those, women's clothing or regalia didn't have the same types of images. Um, they too had different images, patterns and materials that also served as a form of symbolic protection. And I did find this in the Smithsonian collection. This has 50 or more elk teeth on it um, after kind of during the reservation period as the buffalo kind of disappeared um, a lot of these types of dresses were transferred to cotton and wool dresses and that's kind of what you see with this one 
But again, um, just to give you an idea of those beading patterns, you can see so many different beading patterns. Um, a plain specialist would be able, and that is not me, <laughs> but a plain specialist would be able to recognize um, you know, different regalia according to the tribe, just in terms of the color palette, the different colors of beads that are selected, as well as the different types of items. So this is a Lakota girl's dress that you can see on the left, very, very heavily beaded. So this would have only been done after the 1880s when many of the women were kind of, uh, men and women, all of the families were forced onto reservations um, and uh, confined to one place. So they actually had more time to bead. And so that's when you get these really heavily beaded items, but always decoration is kind of a symbol of love, basically. Um, um, and that's what you see too with the crow boys shirt that you can see on the right hand side protective images of a bear claws that i see the morning star which is kind of that cross pattern and then the buffalo and it looks like elk or deer you see those patterns on moccasins as well. And um, there's a Lakota saying, which I think would apply to many of the different Plains groups, which is if it doesn't move, beat it. And so especially in the 1880s and even today, if you ever get a chance to go to a powwow, you'll see these beautifully and very elaborately beaded items. And so that is also something that kind of uh, makes its way into much of Wendy Red Star's work. And uh, just because she is crow and she talks a lot about the color palette of the crow as being really bright, unusual color combinations. That's what you see with these two um, uh, uh, images. These are both crow, one is a bag and then one is a pipe bag. Um, both of these are from the Smithsonian collection in Washington, DC. And then when you look at photographs, from the, particularly from the 1880s and 90s. Um, again, all of the beadwork that you see in the quill work was all done by women for the most part when you're looking at with very few exceptions. And even the children, like that little, the, those two little kids you see on the right, um, so kind of overdone, you might say, with all of the necklaces and all of the beading. But again, that's an expression of love and protection. Um, by the mother or the grandmother in creating all of those items for those children to wear. And you see that with the cradle boards as well, really elaborately beaded cradle boards for the very same reason. Cradle boards. Yeah, have you seen those? So, um, <laughs> The cradle boards, uh, you know, all of the traditions of carrying babies, they go back to cradle boards. Although in California, you see cradle baskets. So they're all entirely woven. And then up in the north in the Arctic, you see babies carried in the hoods of the um, kind of, uh, they're not, par they're like parkas, but they have these very, women have these very big hoods and the babies would be carried there. So when you look at it in terms of most, Native American cultures, especially, but I would guess, you know, across the globe, indigenous cultures, children are carried up until the age of two or three, you know, um, they're, they're, they learn to be watchful because they stay on their parents or mother's back and they observe what's going on for a long period of time. And I've actually had like kinesiology students at, at Sac State that have done papers on cradle boards. And it turns out that, um, children that are confined essentially to cradle boards for large portions of time when they're quite young, they still start walking at the same time and they still, you know, move very well because they're kind of just pushing against their mother's back so much. They still get a chance to develop their muscles, but they are safe um, in one place basically. And so cradle boards are one of those um, traditions um, that are kind of the last to go. Um, and if you think about it, like I know when I had my kids, um, you know, I went straight for the wooden toys first. You kind of want to go back to those kind of traditional items for kids when they're little. And that's kind of what you see with the cradle boards too. So there's still kind of a thriving tradition of cradle boards and cradle baskets in most indigenous communities, again, as a sign of love. 
And so I just wanted to show one more picture of Beatrice, another series that she did, which is um, meant to show off not just Beatrice, but other young girls her age as Absoluca roses, and then often done with different fabric patterns that make their way um, into Native American communities and eventually beaded patterns and floral, I'm sorry, not just beaded, but floral patterns like you see with the roses that her daughter Beatrice is wearing there. And again, look at both of the young girls and you'll see those elk tooth dresses one more time too. So again, she's I'm not even halfway done with all of the different types of works that she's done. Uh, she, um, uh, Red Star also kind of worked in a whole kind of uh, future indigenisms. Um, she was kind of shown at the Gorman Museum at UC Davis. If anybody has not been there, the Gorman Museum, which is currently just online, and they're getting ready to open up their new facility at the UC Davis campus. But it's a great resource for not just Native American, but kind of global indigenous arts. Um, and so a couple of years ago, just before COVID, they had a, an exhibition called Native um, Indigenisms or Future Indigenisms. And it was all about kind of futuristic images, sci-fi works using kind of global artists and global indigenous artists. So this is one of hers, Walks in the Dark. Again, wearing regalia that she designed herself and kind of what she kind of talked about in terms of this photographic series was how natives must have looked to those first explorers, like what we think of as space age aliens today and vice versa how those first explorers must have looked to those indigenous groups as they first set land. And then that idea of new colonization in space. Hey, can you stop doing stuff? You don't want you to do okay, this? so oh. another uh, series um, for which she is very well known. And um, by the way, I'll have a list of resources for you at the end. So if you don't quite catch some of the names that I mentioned, um, keep that in mind. I'll have it for you at the end in terms of some of the works. Um, but this too is another series for which um, she's gotten a lot of text. This is one of the series that you see used in a lot of classrooms, elementary school classrooms, and then in a variety of kind of uh, you know, college classes as well. And I've certainly used it um, for my Native American art classes. Um, uh, as a photographer, um, Red Star was doing some research on the 1880 Crow Peace Delegation. So this was a group of 35 Crow males with a few assorted wives that traveled to Washington DC in 1880 in order to negotiate a land treaty. Um, keep in mind, that by this time, much of their land had been reduced, but the idea of uh, Indian delegations is a long tradition in United States history, going back to the seven, you know, the earliest inception of the United States as an independent government. You would see various groups from the Southeast, the Northeast, and the Plains go to negotiate with the government. Um, it was important for the government. They liked to have these groups come because they were kind of, you know, the government gets to show off its power, its military. The Native American groups are kind of a little bit more isolated, a little bit more on the defensive. Um, but the Native American groups also appreciated the chance in some ways to go and state their case. They uh, were uh, often photographed um, in their regalia um, and then sometimes in their Western clothes as well. So apparently as Red Star tells it, she was looking at some of these photographs of many of these pro members traveled to the United States, or traveled to Washington DC. And uh, her daughter was busy with other stuff and or she was busy with other stuff. Her daughter wanted something to do. So she gave her daughter some Xeroxes, some photocopies of some of these uh, portraits and her daughter started scribbling on them. And so that gave her the idea to create these annotated photographs, which are really brilliant in a lot of ways because here she is literally revising history as we see it. And so what she does is she doesn't just use the common name like Plenty Coup or Medicine Crow, but she goes back and retrieves the crow name for many of these individuals. And then she writes all over the photographs. So it's a great project for kids as well. 
just to think about kind of all of these specific elements um, that uh, 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 make up the regalia, sometimes humorous, sometimes very serious. So if you go through and look, I'm not sure how easy it is, my eyes are always terrible, to see some of the annotations that you see. She talks about the language of feathers, for example, on Plenty Coup and what each one of those feathers means and what he had to do to achieve it. She outlines some of the more important parts. Sometimes she'll mention the fact that she knows the descendant of that particular individual, because again, the descendants of the, this Crow delegation, many of them are still living on the reservation and a part of the living community today. Um, so it's a really fascinating redoing of what we think of as the history of these Native American groups. So here's one of them. Curse. And again, keep in mind, this is at the point of their greatest destruction. So if you look at this skateboard down at the bottom by the Wounded Knee Company, you can see that land loss progression of native lands going from, you know, holding everything in 1491 down to those very, very small kind of little sections of reservations that got smaller and smaller as more people crowded in. That's a history, not just of land loss, uh, but cultural destruction. Um, uh, there's a history of, uh, uh, you know, a wide scale kind of devastation, um, Indian land for sale, get a home of your own by just displacing the Native Americans, the scalpings that were introduced by the United States government as a means of um, paying bounties on Native Americans, but not having to deal with so many of the corpses see that in California as well. Um, during this reservation period, there's a long and documented history of the US government sending um, blankets that were infected with smallpox in order to reduce the populations as well. Um, so it's a really kind of devastating history that you see. And that too is something that she talks about. Here's a few photographs of the actual Crow Peace Delegation as they were sitting there. And again, you can see some of them choosing to be dressed in Western clothes, some of them choosing to be dressed in their regalia. Um, and all of the photographs that were taken by Edward Curtis or the portraits were painted by George Catlin of many of these individuals as they came to Washington DC to kind of state their case. So these are the types of photographs that Wendy Redstar is kind of pushing back on by annotating them in various ways. So here is that one that we've already seen um, kind of looked at in several cases. Let me show you a couple more. Here you can see um, another one on the side. So each one of them has myriad kind of stories to tell in terms of Wendy Red Star's commentary. Um, you'll see all kinds of kind of funny and amusing comments at this point. I, I didn't write any of them down. I thought I'd be able to see them a little bit better here, but you can kind of go through and look at some of them yourself. That looks good. Um, uh, you know, something kind of humorous. And then the very serious ones as well. This is the one I wanted to get to. I guess it's this one. Um, the individual um, that it turns out his body was sold uh, for something like $50 um, and sent to a museum. Um, so again, it's kind of pushing back at those traditional narratives that we hear about Indians and also kind of bringing that up to date in terms of museum policies, even today, even Sac State has thousands and thousands of human remains that they still have, but they're still trying to track down those communities um, and museums historically, including the Museum of uh, Natural History um, and uh, the American Museum of Natural History, as well as the Smithsonian, <clears throat> that were found um, just in the last few decades to still be holding on to the remains, um, the heads in many cases of uh, many different individuals, including Ishi from California. And so this is, a, this is a, one of the comments that uh, uh, in an interview that Wendy Redstar made um, about some of these images and kind of why she wanted to do it. So I thought it was kind of a worthwhile quote um, just to see that. One of the really interesting points that I hadn't known until getting this lecture ready is that the original photographer um, for some of these um, uh, images actually had them use feather dusters so that they could look more Indian. And of course, that's kind of one of the uh, 
problems for many people with Edward Curtis because he kind of wanted to fancy many of his sitters up. They didn't look Indian enough for him, so they would add in other elements. And so that's kind of what you see here as well. And then another way she kind of uh, reclaims those portraits is by getting rid of them all entirely. Um, this one is called Let Them Have Their Voice and from 2016. And in this one, she um, erases their images and leaves only the silhouettes behind. And then in the gallery, and unfortunately I don't have this part for you, in the gallery actually she had audio going of recordings of Absoluka singers from the 1880s. 1880s. Um, she recovered um, in some museums wax cylinder recordings of many of those traditional songs. And so that's the voice that she gave them. So instead of having that visual identity that we were so used to, instead she kind of gave them back their voice in terms of their songs, their ceremonial songs. And that actually led to a larger installation piece of uh, uh, this Crow Peace Delegation from 2021. Um, Actually, this is the wrong, the wrong name for it. So I apologize. This is not the Crow Peace Delegation. This is the 1898 Indian Congress. So I didn't label that correctly. This was meant to commemorate another historical event that she did research on, which was an Indian Congress, which was held on the occasion of the Nebraska Trans-Mississippi Exposition. Um, so for that exposition, 30 tribes, mainly from across the plains, gathered to create kind of their own assembly or Indian Congress. And so all of them gathered in their regalia. Some of the wives accompanied them. That's kind of what you see here. Another woman in her elk tooth dress. That looks like she's got more than 50 elk tooth on that one, I think. Um, and so what she, what Wendy Redstar wanted to do was to commemorate that and kind of in a way bring some of those photographs to life. So she listed, all, she kind of uh, recreated all of those photographs in a, kind of a seated kind of um, uh, uh, bleacher kind of style arrangement that you can see there with larger kind of life-size portraits of some of those individuals. So again, she really does kind of use all of the different kind of visual and um, strategies in terms of the work she does. Here's another image of that. And then there's one of those over life-size portraits that accompanied it. So pre brief, brief break here. This is kind of our halfway point. And actually, I'm kind of impressed with myself, I have to say. And those of you guys that have had me know, I always run late. So I'm almost exactly halfway here. So uh, what I wanted to say is um, uh, give you a chance. I know we don't actually have a break. But if you are interested in the last half hour or so to do the art project, um, I just wanted to give you a chance to ask it before we get started on to ask any questions about the project itself. It's pretty simple. It shouldn't take too long. Um, you'll see some kind of images, but uh, I just wanted to include that for you here. Um, I kind of went through and did a practice one myself. I can't actually show it to you because it wasn't glued down, but I'll redo it again. Um, but I found that all of this was all I needed, either an eight and a half or a 12 by 12 piece of paper as a mount. Keep in mind, you can use kind of any kind of paper, colored construction paper, wrapping paper, or even if you just kind of have some cut squares, you can always add your own color onto it. Um, scissors help if you haven't actually cut them up yet. Um, you can use a glue stick to kind of place everything down first. If you don't have a glue stick, you can also use uh, just regular glue, which will fix it better. Um, I'm actually gonna use Mod Podge, I decided, because um, that way I can kind of move things around a little bit while it's drying, and then I can kind of cover everything. So you have a variety of things that you can use, and then a copy of your family photo or the actual family photo too. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is what I did in order to cut the triangles, if anybody wants to be cutting any triangles while I'm talking is um, you can actually take a whole piece of paper or a strip of paper and in order to make it go faster of course you can just um, fold it so you'll get multiple pieces measure out um, I did a two by two inch square so kind of measured it this way two by two inch square cut those squares and then I just cut them in half 
And I'm not a detail oriented person. So not all of mine are precisely two by two, but it'll work for what we're doing basically. Um, and uh, the pattern I found seemed to be kind of the simplest for me. Um, so those are kind of the different colors that you can use, but you can also just use it in two colors as well. We'll kind of walk you through the steps. Does anybody have any questions about that? If they were interested in getting it together while I was talking? You can um, speak out loud or I forgot to mention, but you can always put any questions you have while I'm talking into the chat because I'm happy to answer them there too. Any questions? We're good? Okay, I'll keep on going then. Um, and if you do come up with a question as you're getting those things together, as I said, feel free to put anything into the chat. I've got it up and so I can monitor it. Oh, I guess I did show you. See, this is kind of my quick sloppy picture with my phone in terms of the different kinds of paper I was using. I didn't realize I put it here. I thought I put it at the end and then kind of the different designs. So that can give you some ideas just in terms of what you wanna use in terms of different kinds of paper. Um, I started with the one on the left, just to let you know, um, and then I decided it looked kind of weird. And so then I decided to do all patterns. And so that's kind of the change that you see on the right. Um, the initial square is what we have the pattern for, but if you're using eight and a half by 11 paper, which is what I used, um, you have a little bit of leftover. So you can also use extras to kind of cut a strip. Um, for a border or use the triangles themselves as a border too. So that's kind of the outcome of, or kind of hopefully somewhat of the outcome. I changed it a little bit one more time too, but um, that's kind of the idea of what we're gonna be doing. And I was really excited myself. Um, I was looking for a family photo. So those are my four kids. The oldest is now 30 and the youngest is 18. He does not remember even visiting Yellowstone River and Yellowstone, I'm sorry. Yeah, Yellowstone River and Valley, uh, which is what you see in the background. So I thought it was perfectly appropriate for this work based on Wendy Red Star. So it was kind of a lucky coincidence to be able to find that one. So second half, I just wanna show you some of her other work. And I just wanna call attention to the date, 2021. She's done all of this work um, while raising a child in the last 10, what is it? 10, 13, 14 years. So it's a really impressive body of work. That's what I mean when I say just the scope of all of her work. Um, is really amazing when you think about it, um, just in terms of the time. She actually does um, somewhere between, if you look at like her website, which is www.wendyredstar.com, it's always the best place to go if you're looking for information on a contemporary artist is how they want to present themselves on their website. Um, but if you look at that, she has three to five exhibitions every year, even during COVID, I have to say. Some of them group, some of them solo. So she is a very, very, as Emma, uh, as Emma and I were talking about, very, very busy. So this is actually one of the favorite series of my daughter um, who designed a kids class for this one because she worked with Emma a few years ago as a art intern when she was in college. And um, so it's a whole other series that Wendy Red Star has done. And one of the things that she started doing in the last, I'm not even sure, maybe let's say eight to 10 years, is that she starts titling all of her works in the Absoluka language. That too is a very conscious choice that you see a lot of artists doing in order to not just reclaim their language, but to preserve their language. She is not fluent in Absoluka, but her father does. And so in some of her works, her father's voice will be there kind of uh, speaking in Absoluka. It's part, very important, as I said, something like 11,000 um, uh, federally or tribally enrolled Absoluka today, but only about three or 4,000 speakers, which is actually a pretty good percentage rate when you look at other Native American groups. Um, the preservation of language is kind of really critically important. And so you see a lot of different strategies used by tribes in order to teach that next generation some of the language. Um, so in terms of kind of cultural reclamation, kind of trying to preserve some of these cultural traditions, you see that with this series of work, which is called Brings Good Horses. 
you see that with this series of work in terms of the language and then the tradition that she's uh, kind of channeling as well. Several, first of all, the importance of horses. Um, uh, horses were essential to kind of uh, Plains culture as a whole. Um, prior to the, in, in fact, one of the things I teach my students or talk with about talk about with my students is that Plains culture is really a post-contact culture in some ways. While many groups lived around the Plains and many groups lived and hunted the buffalo, kind of had the buffalo as kind of one of their uh, kind of keystone sources, um, it was not until the introduction of the horse that individual men could go off and hunt the buffalo. Prior to that, it was a communal exercise with women, children, and men all hunting the buffalo together because one man alone walking could not stand up against the buffalo, could not catch a buffalo. So it's only with the horse that you see that. And that's why the horse is so highly regarded and so honored in many different Plains cultures. The Lakota term for horse kind of translates to sacred dog. Um, and in many cases, kind of one of the highest achievements of a warrior was again, not to kill an enemy, but to steal horses from an enemy camp, for example. Um, so horses are a symbol of honor and also a symbol of wealth. And so you see them honored in many different ways. That's part of what Wendy Red Star is doing with this series. Um, they had a they had a big exhibit at the uh, Smithsonian National M uh, Museum of the American Indian a few years ago. It was called Songs for the Horse Nation. And you can still see an online version on it. And it was really just spectacular to see the different types of regalia that were um, afforded to the horses, not just the saddles, but the masks that could be used in some cases, all of the different accessories that were related to a horse, really, really kind of stunning exhibition because much of it was placed on these life-size kind of horse models like you see here. So a picture very importantly, just as the buffalo did, but to go back to a second element that Wendy Red Star brings into these works is, you know, that way of life was completely disappearing by the 1880s. So this is kind of a timeline that I show my students in terms of the destruction of Plains culture um, from the Indian Removal Act that took away land from those existing Plains group and gave it to all of those relocated Eastern groups like the Cherokee and the Chickasaw, um, many of those other groups. Um, that land that was um, kind of that they were left with was taken away even more when gold was discovered in the Black Hills. <clears throat> the Lakota's lands were reduced at that point um, because many of these Native American groups fought back in order to keep their land. And you had the whole series of what were called Indian Wars. Um, you had many warriors that would be imprisoned. The most famous event being the group of Cheyenne and Kiowa warriors that were imprisoned at Fort Marion in Florida for a period of time. In 1877, the Dawes Act was enacted, and basically that took all of the lands that were remaining to these Plains group and reduced it from 91 million to 8 million acres. Not only did they reduce it, they changed the ownership, whereas the land had been held communally before, they allotted it to individual families and men, which made it much easier to lose. So in actual fact, um, the land was reduced not to 8 million, but much less than that, as much of that land was lost. It was bought, it was stolen, it was swindled away and things like that. Um, it's during this same time as many of these different groups are basically in this reservation system that you see the beginnings of government boarding schools. Um, interestingly enough, we had the Pope. I was doing a Renaissance class right now. And so we were talking about the First Nations groups from Canada that visited the Vatican Vatican um, just about a month ago or two months ago, and the Pope formally apologized to them for uh, the treatment of the church, uh, the treatment of made, uh, First Nations children in these government boarding schools or in the religious boarding schools in Canada. You have the same exact um, system that occurs in all across the United States. Um, many of their ceremonies were banned in the 1880s, and then again as a specific governmental project, uh, the buffalo were exterminated. 
um, uh, going from 50 million to essentially none in a few short decades. The idea being that if the buffalo were gone, then the Indians would want to sit down and farm. Um, they didn't really give a lot of training on how to farm. And again, it was a total change of their life ways. So that too was not very successful. But it's during this time, kind of this really tragic time that you do see these new art forms develop, namely the ledger drawings, like the images that you see on the top of this slide here. So ledger drawings were a means for Native American men to translate their narrative exploits from hide to paper, essentially. Um, as they were reservated, they no longer had those animal skins on which, you know, for the teepees and for the buffalo robes, for the clothing, and in which to put kind of all of those events. And that was a very important tradition for many of these Plains warriors and these Plains men to translate their designs and their, their dreams and their experiences into a visual form. Um, so the tradition of ledger drawing came about as many of these men would get ledger paper, basically accountants ledger paper from the um, trading posts on the reservations. And they would continue to kind of draw their exploits. And in many cases, um, you know, they would get paid. They could sell these works. Um, the prisoners at Fort Marion, for example, um, their, their drawings, this squint eyes was one of those um, one of those warriors that was held at Fort Marion. And so they, they were allowed, those prisoners were allowed to sell their drawings basically to tourists that would come and visit and watch them dance basically at Fort Marion as well. Um, so this became a way to remember their past basically and show their traditions, um, usually using kind of colored pencil, sometimes watercolors, but basically colored pencil um, in a very similar style to what you saw on the teepees and the the clothing and the buffalo robes and things like that. So this ledger drawing tradition becomes very important because it's taken up by thousands of warriors. There's thousands of these different types of images that you can find in museums and historical societies all across the country today. This one shows a buffalo hunt. Here's another one by a different artist that kind of shows the travel going, moving camp, going from one place to another and the horses kind of carrying everything on those kind of what are called travoir sleds in the back. Um, here are some other images of kind of the um, having fun with the buffalo, the skinning of a buffalo. So they really are today kind of recognized as kind of a primary source document of Plains history by the Plains people themselves. Instead of anthropologists writing down what these traditions are, these is Plains culture in the voice of many of these Plains artists. And so um, I work with some fourth and fifth grade classes. Uh, uh, my sister actually this year just started teaching fifth grade. So I'm looking forward to kind of doing a presentation on ledger drawings with her students so they can compare kind of the settlers accounts with what, of what happened with the accounts of these Plains people themselves. Here, for example, is an image from a Cheyenne warrior, which kind of shows this idea of these very anonymous troops amassed against a Cheyenne village. And in a textbook one day, I can't take credit for finding this pairing, but uh, um, a treaty signing, an actual treaty signing at Medicine Creek Lodge in 1867 in a comparison the way two different artists see it. Um, an artist for Harper's Weekly and his rendition of this treaty signing event at Medicine Creek. And so what's interesting is you mainly see the United States representatives. You see some of the warriors in the background and no women at all whatsoever. Whereas Howling Wolf's version shows the soldiers as well as the treaty signing, but he also shows each individual teepee. You could recognize the community and the women that are kind of witnessing the event as well. So it's interesting to see those two different viewpoints. Um, and it's interesting to think about how this captures so many of these men kind of between two worlds. And so probably the most famous ledger drawing is this one by another artist that was imprisoned at Fort Marion named Woha, because he kind of shows himself kind of stuck in between two worlds. On the one side, you can see the buffalo. You can see he's holding his pipe here. Um, the teepee, his own teepee, and the teepee circle that makes his community. Whereas on the other side, he's holding a rifle, um, cattle, 
and then you can see kind of the house with the allotment of land. So um, kind of a poignant kind of reminder of how difficult it must have been to kind of traverse these two worlds. In addition to that, you have actual historical events. So Andrew Fox actually depicted many different military battles and you recognize the warriors with their regalia. So Sitting Bull, the warrior is coming along here. He's recognized by his acoustic and his shield. So if you look at other accounts of some of these battles, like the Battle of Little Bighorn, you'll also see Sitting Bull with his shield. That's how you kind of identify him. And then he had that very specific top knot. So these are actually kind of those renditions of the historical events, no different than any drawing by a uh, American artist or a little bit later, even the photographers in terms of the, the um, validity of the viewpoint, I guess you could say. And then you have other slices of life. And I brought in this one just to show it's not all about battles. You also see kind of courting couples, different kinds of parades. But I also brought this one because you can see that literally many of them are done on ledger paper. And so that's kind of what you see here. Um, so much so that that is a tradition you see a lot of contemporary artists that are using today. Arthur Amiot is a Lakota art historian and elder. Um, so he's probably most famous for his version of ledger drawings. Here too, you can see his grandmother and his grandfather. His grandmother is also wearing an elk tooth dress, if you look closely. Um, you can also see kind of the lines of the ledger drawing. And so he kind of overlays it with a lot of other elements as well. Um, but again, it's, it's one way that you see contemporary artists using those ledger drawings still. Um, even when you look at Joan Quicks to see Smith's work. So if you're familiar with the Crocker, you might've seen this work, which is hers that is held by the Crocker. This too um, overlays past documents, newspapers and things like that, and then puts other images on them kind of in a parallel to what we see with ledger drawings. And so that actually is what uh, Wendy Redstar is reviving again is this ledger drawing tradition when she takes these horses and what she does with the horses is really interesting. She researched the horses the historical horses held by the crow and other warriors. She claims them, kind of takes them again, which is again, the sign of a warrior, um, names them um, by, she claims them by drawing them and naming them and then put them together in this collection of rather than being on ledger paper on this Italian marbleized paper. So this is why my daughter wanted to do this as a art, art project for kids, because it's that idea of, um, honoring a pet, an animal with which you have a connection. And then actually, let me show you a close up. Oh, that one close up is a little bit pixelated. So sorry about that. Um, but you can get a better sense of them kind of close up, each one an individual horse on that kind of marbled background. And then she did more. She's still kind of creating these new areas. She did an internship, or actually not an internship, a fellowship um, at the Denver Art Museum. And uh, when she was doing that, she actually discovered in their library, these old catalog cards. Remember when you had catalog cards, card catalogs for the library? So she found the card catalogs of all of the different objects basically um, that were held by the collection, held in the collection. And some anonymous person that had worked on that collection not only noted the different items, but painted an image of them. So she replicated these cards from the card catalog and then added images of Crow people at the Crow Fair using that same type of regalia. So the accession card for this beaded band that you see here is meant to be echoed in this color photograph of a contemporary Crow individual, Absoluka Crow individual, parading in their regalia at the Crow Fair, which we're gonna talk about, which occurs still every year. So it's a really interesting kind of a, uh, collection of work. When I saw a session, I have to say, I thought it had some kind of play on words on that TV show succession, but no, a session is kind of that term for items that are added to a museum collection. So these were both added, both of these items were added in um, 1949. You can see object 105 on the left, the hat that was added, 
a contemporary crow horse rider uh, with a similar style hat. And then this one that we looked at, which was also collected in 1949 from uh, item number 72. I brought in this one just because it shows, um, I believe it's, a, I think it's called a martingale. I meant to go look up what a martingale is, but this is what you have here. These are all not beads, but quills. It's a very simple design, but often the quilled designs are really seen to be the most sacred. Um, actually, as I'm looking at it, at Wendy Redstar called it a martingale. It looks like a quilling bag. So in this bag, you would have kind of all of the most important items. And then you have this similar bag here another individual at the Crow Fair. If you look closely at the dress and the face, this is Beatrice, one more time, uh, Wendy Redstar's daughter, and then her father, Kevin, uh, no, not Kevin, um, Wendell Redstar. No, I'm sorry, Kevin Redstar, and she was named after her uncle, Wendell. Um, but this is her father, um, Kevin Redstar, that sometimes collaborates with her on some of her works too. And then she keeps on going, um, appropriation is a very uh, big category of postmodern art, taking something um, and uh, appropriating something and putting it in a new context in order to kind of look at the original meaning of the object. And so that's what she, Wendy Redstar does with this white squaw series. You would think that she made up this whole thing, but no, all she did was put her face on existing covers of a whole series of books written by E.J. Hunter um, that are all under the name of the series is White Squaw. Um, all of them with these really kind of, shall we just say, icky kind of double entendres, pay, um, bareback beauty, twin peaks or bust. Um, and so she just kind of emphasizes that kind of shall we say, just gross eroticism <laughs> that is kind of channeled in a lot of these works. I have to say the scariest thing about this series is that it's a series from the 1990s. We're not talking about something from the 1960s. It wasn't done too long ago. And so as Red Star tells it, she was in a bookstore and she came across one of these. She became so fascinated by it that she kind of bought up as many as she could through eBay and Amazon and things like that and did this whole series using herself kind of as that female protagonist with like that come hither look and the tomahawk and everything else so um, again always using humor and again just kind of changing things then she goes back to photography 2016 2017 um, and did a whole series of photographs based on the reservation um, so the whole series itself is my home is where my TP sits, um, supposedly uh, something that a Native American elder said in um, negotiation with the government in terms of uh, treaty lands, treaty negotiations. And so this series is very specific stylistically in terms of kind of this grid, this collection or family of objects that she creates. So in this case, it's a whole series of images that are based on signs around the reservation that you see here. This one is some of the HUD housing that you find on the reservation. Um, so all of these are actual houses taken from the Absoluca Crow Reservation. And one of the points she makes is she did not change the colors. Some of them actually are orange, some of them are lavender. And most of the people themselves that live on the reservation, they just take an educated guess that the government is just giving them the cheapest paint available. And so that's why there's really no rhyme or reason to the colors that you see in terms of the housing. And then she did a whole series of other works to the churches or religious structures on the housing. Um, and then the cars, um, there's a whole, she does actually several different series based on reservation cars. And in one of the reserve and one of the interviews, she was talking about the fact that on the reservation cars can sit there for years and years and years. And she said that when she was growing up or in high school, you know, she, um, she, a friend of hers would store all their horse tech in kind of a rundown truck that was sitting in their front yard or a rundown car. So she stored it and, you know, instead of storing it in the house, just stored it in the trunk of the car. And so these are all actual cars that you see on the reservation. 
and then other houses that you can see here on the left and then other shelters sweat lodge she did a sweat lodge series too kind of all the different items used to make a sweat lodge um, for purification something that's still done today as well and because we're talking about the reservation, I just have to put in a plug for reservation dogs. If you're interested at all in contemporary Native American culture, reservation dogs is in its second season. You can see it on Hulu. These are the four um, five actors um, that play the teenagers that are the subjects of the show, all indigenous. And so what's really notable about reservation dogs is that um, it is uh, uh, written by Sterling Harjo in collaboration with Taika Waititi. Uh, Taika Waititi is the Marvel director and then he did um, uh, the rabbit Hitler. I can't remember what it was called, but it's a really well-known director who is um, Maori. And so he's been very involved in indigenous uh, causes. And so he and Sterling Harjo produced this uh, show, which is filmed on um, a reservation in Oklahoma and centers around these five characters and their families living on the reservation, all of them actually indigenous themselves. Um, really funny um, in a very Native American kind of way. Um, also channels and quotes smoke signals, which is kind of the most well-known Native American comedy. Um, any Native American I know has probably seen that movie probably at least five times. Um, so if you're bored and want something to watch, it's a really good show to watch. And then um, not only did she take those cars as photographs, she also created a series of what she called res shawls. Um, so these are all in kind of this cheap, polyester -y kind of material, but um, uh, photo overlays of some of the different cars. So again, she's not just talking about past ways of life and beating traditions, ledger drawing traditions. She's also talking about the importance of today's world as well. Um, so instead of horses, it's cars. And so in this installation, you can see the beating um, design in the background. Uh, she actually had a friend who is known for decorating cars in the Crow Parade um, help her with this, um, I think it's a paper mache version of a car um, that might be used in a float. And I should have brought in some close-ups, but if you look at her series with the different cars, um, all kinds of elaborate decorations that are used for the Crow Fair, which we're going to be talking about in a second too. And then lastly, again, because she considers herself a textile artist, she does design some foxy dresses um, and do some of her work based on fashion too. We're almost getting to the quilts. I just wanted to show you a couple more. Recently in 2021, she had an exhibit in Newark and New Jersey. And so it featured a shelter, which is what you see here. Um, not like traditional wood, but the way people use it today with whatever kinds of fabric they can find um, to create this shelter. You could actually go into that sweat lodge and you could see a film of herself and another artist, their collaboration as they visited the Absoluka Reservation. And then look closely and you can see surrounding it in this installation is um, a whole series of photographs that are all put together. It's basically a historical timeline of the Crow Fair. So the Crow Fair is an annual exhibition basically that is still held today. It's been held the third week in August since 1904. So it's over a hundred years old. And basically it started out as kind of a ceremonial adaptation of uh, what, what a traditional life way. So when people, the Crow or the Absolute and many of the other Plains people, when they were moving from camp to camp, it kind of creates a parade, a long line of people with all of their belongings, basically, as they move to the next spot. Once they were reservated, basically, the government kind of said, well, you can do this fair or this parade every year um, to kind of replicate that. So that's been going on since 1904. Um, according to Wendy Redstar, it gets over 50,000 people every year when it's held. I think part of it actually was featured on a Yellowstone episode too. Um, about 11,000 of them are pro. 
according to kind of what she said, that's the entire Crow population of 11,000, I should say. So it's a huge event. So what Wendy Red Star did was she took all of those photographs of the Crow Fair from 1904 to the present and she put them together in this kind of timeline and just like she did with those other works she annotated them as well so you can kind of see all of the different text that's here and this is the crow name for the event um you i'll let you read it yourself partly because i in the chat i can't see it where they make noise i think is what it's called and then i don't want to mispronounce it um the the absolute pronunciation but it's really fascinating to see all the bits and pieces of it from the 1920s and the 1930s you get to see uh beatrice grow up she's always featured all of the years that she participated in the crow fair you get to see some of the cars that are there and everything else is it kind of travels basically around the room so again really that idea of um continuing kind of the way these traditions evolve um but continue over time which is again the ultimate expression of survivance as you go from 1904 basically to those 2016 photographs and then here's a close up so you can see um, a little bit better. Um, now, as, as you're looking, you can kind of see some of the, 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 the things that Wendy Wright Star points out. Here she is herself with Beatrice ready to go in the jingle dress. Sometimes in some of the comments, she's like, I'm not sure why I wore that color lipstick. That color doesn't look good on me. Um, her daughter's friends as they're growing up, her grandmother, her grandfather, all of those different community members. So it really is kind of this living timeline of the the absoluta crow community and that was contained i could not find another picture of this um, but i was really fascinated by this image that you see in the background this is also from that 26 uh, 2021 exhibit in new york newark she basically took um a, a gigantic projection of the absoluta crow reservation and all of those different allotments and then she placed the photographs of the matriarchs, the women that were still living in those areas. So I thought it was kind of really poignant in terms of kind of this very kind of dry governmental map that's kind of enlivened by all of the people that are living there basically. But that was as much as I could find. I do wanna put in a plug before I forget of a book that just came out. I'll have the details for you. Um, so uh, I didn't, I just got this this morning basically. So I didn't get a chance to use it too much for the lecture, but I'm really looking forward to reading it because it's got all of those different works. So if you're interested, it runs about 45 to $50. Um, it's really the only monograph of Wendy Red Star's work. I'm sure it's just the first, because again, as I mentioned, she's only in her forties right now, early forties. So she's got a long ways to go too. Um, she also, uh, as, as somebody that went through the school system, didn't feel like she learned enough as somebody that has collaborated so closely with her daughter over a period of time. She also does a lot of children's installations. And so for Mass MOCA, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Massachusetts, she did specifically a kids exhibit um, that was much more kind of kid friendly. And I just brought this in to show you where you can see kind of what an impact those photographs can make when they're blown up to such a huge scale here. And now we get to the quilting project too. So let me check the time here. We're doing pretty good in terms of the time. So I can at least introduce it to you. Um, that is one of our latest projects basically. And um, quilting is not so far removed from all of those other projects that we have done um, because quilting also has a long tradition in Native American cultures. If there wasn't so much to talk about, I actually have slides that I'll sometimes show my students, but um, in general, there's so many other contemporary arts I've run out of time to show the quilting, but there definitely is a long tradition for a couple different reasons. Um, when we talked about quilling and beading projects, in fact, let me see here. When we talked about quilling and beading projects of traditional Plains Lifeways or historical Plains Lifeways, many of those were collaborative projects. So, you know, we, we I showed you a lot of very, very elaborate beaded items and you saw some of the men's garments that women would quill and bead. And in fact, women, 
um, could get up at the council fire and all of those plains communities basically. And when men talked about their exploits in terms of horses they'd stolen or battles they'd won, women also had the equal right to stand up and talk about their achievements in quilling and beating as well. And the highest achievement was to quill a teepee liner, not a complicated process, but really critical because it formed kind of the insulating curtains inside a teepee. Um, Because if you think about a teepee, especially in the middle of winter, it can get really cold. So those curtains were that insulating factor. So it literally forms the home. And perhaps for that reason, it's the most important item. Only a few women in every community had the honor um, and status to be able to quill these teepee liners. Um, but the point that I also wanted to make was these were always collaborative projects. So one woman would be, would be in charge and they were in charge of hosting and gifting the others. But these large scale projects like teepees and teepee liners and even other types of items had to be done with a variety of women. So they had their own quilling circles. So it kind of makes sense that quilting circles would also become important once the buffalo were gone. And as women kind of were again in this reservation period, they no longer had the buffalo hides or the deer hides to quill um, extra fabric. Um, fabric allotments that were shipped into the reservations were also something that they could use. And so they translated that quilling community to quilting communities and circles. And so quilting too becomes a tradition that you see on many of the Plains reservations, but really kind of all across the country as well. Um, so that is the tradition that Wendy Redstar was kind of referencing when she started to create a whole series of photographs based on that. Um, the photograph that you see here is her great, great grandmother, Julia Badboy one of the earliest photographs of her family members. And as I said, she's done research in all kinds of different places, including places like ancestry.com. So she um, started to take kind of this idea of quilling pa uh, quilting patterns and translate them to photography. And much of her quilting projects are based on what's called the star quilt. And I didn't realize kind of the significance of the star quilt um, until I was kind of doing research for this lecture. But one of the reasons you see many different Native American quilters use that star quilt is because it's meant to represent the morning star. The morning star is a really important cultural symbol in many different Native American groups across the continent. In the case of, and each, each, each community has a different belief for the morning star, um, but for the crow, according to some sources, so I can't verify its uh, truth exactly, is that morning star is the grandchild of what's called old woman in some cases, or translated kind of a, not a creator woman, but kind of like an earth mother. Um, uh, uh, the morning star himself is the son of her daughter and the son, and then goes on to become a monster slayer and then goes up to live in the sky as a morning star. And the morning star kind of is really, I don't wanna say it's a timekeeper, but in many ceremonies, because it's the last one, the last star to leave the morning sky. That's why it's called the morning star um, and very recognizable in the early evening too. It's used as a touchstone in many different ways. And so kind of this idea of the star quilt, which originates in other regions as well is very transferable to some of these Native American beliefs. And so she does a whole series of works based on that. Um, taking family photographs of soldiers, of her different family members, and kind of overlaying them onto some of these digitized quilt projects. Um, and again, there's such a large collection of um, quilts, uh, or uh, quilting is such a, a, a big project for Native American communities that the Smithsonian actually has a very large collection of quilts themselves. So these are some of the quilts that you see at the Smithsonian 
all of them, if you notice, kind of use this same star design. And it's usually very specifically this eight pointed star. Um, four is important in many different uh, Native American traditions, kind of referring to the four cardinal directions of north, south, east, and west. And then you have kind of the other four directions, which in some stories, I can't say it's always true, are meant to represent kind of the four stages of life. Um, here are some other quilts that are not star quilts, but also found in the Smithsonian collection too. Um, I just wanted to mention this one by Marie Watts. Um, she created this uh, basically paper image of a star quilt, um, um, also referencing this idea of a morning star. Um, and you can kind of see the fall of stars. This is a very typical kind of signature design of Marie Watts that you can see there. Um, one of her fabric, uh, not, yeah, I guess it's a quilt. One of her fabric quilts is actually held by the Crocker, if you've ever seen it. I have a picture of it if you want to see it later, if we have time. And then this is the one I forgot, I'm sorry, I forgot to put down the title, but you can see four generations basically of her family. You can see uh, her daughter, Beatrice, one more time, Wendy Red Star, her father who served in Vietnam, and then her grandmother as a child in the, uh, in the uh, elk tooth dress one more time too. So again, uh, what I really liked about Wendy Red Star is just the way that she is able to, um, channel so many different aspects of Native American history, um, but also Native American cultural traditions, and then create these images that have so much resonance for us today. So I'm glad I was not the one that picked this topic. So I'm certainly glad that Emma picked um, Wendy Red Star as an artist to know, because I think um, definitely you should be seeing her around in the future as well. Here's one called Two Prom Dates, a family portrait. And then the last series of images, I think this is probably the last one that I have for you, is um, her most recent series, as far as I can tell, it's called Echo or Amnia in Absoluca from 2021. Um, it features her, um, her great, great grandmother, Julia Badboy. And what she does is, um, because, you know, when we're talking about figures from the past, particularly dispossessed people from the past as her great grandmother and many Native Americans were, you tend to see kind of a very one dimensional image of them. And so her idea is to give them three dimensions one more time. So she kind of takes these echoes, gradually larger echoes to create these three dimensional images, first of all, of Julia Bad Boy, which is what you can see on the right, and then of her descendant. Um, Wendy Red Star that you can see here on the left. I think it's also appropriate to look at the image this way too, just because um, uh, I think that it kind of reflects kind of how her those ideas kind of echo in so many different ways kind of in her entire body of work as well. So now we go to the quilt. Before we do the quilting project, we have about 15 minutes or so. Um, so that should be enough time to give you an idea of the project for anybody that's interested. But there are any questions or comments from anybody? While we're talking, I'll go to this, which has some of the information on some of those um, sources that I mentioned. Um, her website, as I mentioned, um, she created this hashtag, Absoluca Feminist. Um, as I said, there hasn't been a lot of activity on it now, but it's a good example of how she really kind of harnesses uh, social media. I suppose what I should have done is I should have looked up Wendy Red Star TikTok, but I'll leave you guys to do that for yourself. Um, oh, one other thing that I really wanted to mention too is one of the reasons I really um, like her as well, one of the many reasons is that when she was teaching up in Portland, she had her students start a Tumblr account of contemporary native artists. And that for me is actually one of the best sources 
for uh, different Native American artists and their body of work. And so that's why I included it there. So again, it's a good example of how her work goes beyond just those exhibition walls in which she's kind of actively reaching into new territories as well. And then uh, the next two are just different magazine articles. I looked at a lot of different magazine articles, but I found those two most helpful. And then lastly, Smart History, which if you're not familiar with is a great art history source for students and educators and docents and anybody interested in the arts um, with uh, videos and text on all kinds of different things. So there's a short, um, there's quite a few, if you look on YouTube, there's actually quite a few artist talks with Wendy Redstar. Some of them can be kind of long, like an hour to an hour and a half long. So one of the reasons I placed just this smart history one is it's just a six minute interview with her talking about the Crow Peace Delegation that we looked at those annotated photographs as well. Um, any questions at all though? And I can go back to this one now. Any questions? No? Um, you guys ready to uh, do to see how to do the project? <laughs> I'm going to do my best in terms of transitioning from one thing to the other. Um, so again, speak out loud if you like, and especially trying to do a project like this by Zoom um, might be a little bit harder too, but I think I can at least start the project so you can kind of see how to do it. So again, you actually don't need too much paper and it went, took me like three minutes to cut the paper just by folding it and cutting it that way. And again, what I recommend is not necessarily fixing everything in place, doing it flat on a surface in a way that nobody can see you on Zoom, of course, uh, but this way you can kind of rearrange the papers as you like. Because I did notice I had one pattern all set up that is what I was planning to do. But then when I started to do it, it did not work out quite so well. So that is one thing that I would say. The next thing that I will say is I took a piece of paper like this and I just did this roughly. So don't copy me at home, but I basically measured out the exact middle of the piece because it's best for this kind of project to start in the middle and then work your way outwards. So if you do that and kind of follow, I'm going to eyeball it and say the middle is kind of right about there. Not sure if you can see the little dot. So start in that way, basically. And then hey, Laurie, the if you collapse your PowerPoint, you'll be much. Oh, better. that's true. I totally forgot about that. So let me go to escape, I think is the way I want to do it. Is that right? Can you see better now? Let's see, we st I still see the PowerPoint. So stop share, let's see. Let's try the stop share. That's this, okay, this is one thing I've never- There we go. Better? Okay. So here we go. So here's kind of my thing like this. Okay. Um, our, can I say one thing really quickly? Well, no, I'm going to go ahead and do this. For anybody that wants to stick around, um, I wanted to make sure I covered this, um, this uh, art project, but for anybody that wants to stick around, even if they're not going to do the art project, the one last thing I have is I did um, have, because I always have extra artists, but I did have a selection of a couple of the indigenous women artists that the Crocker has. So I'll do this for a couple minutes, answer any questions, and if we have any time left, I'm happy to go over those really quickly with people too. So I'm going to use Mod Podge instead of the glue, mainly because um, I can get it to stick just a little bit, um, but I can still readjust. Um, a glue stick will kind of do the same thing, but I found my glue stick was kind of old, so it didn't work too well. The second thing I'm going to do is I know my picture is kind of big and I'm not even going to be able to see the middle. So the first thing I'm going to do is just stick this here. So that's kind of the placeholder for the center. And then I'm going to build everything around it. And then mainly all you have to do after that, let me make sure I have this. I need to put in a little bit more Mod Podge. And I'm just going to show you, it takes like two seconds to show you how to do it. It's much simpler than I thought. And I'm thinking about doing something like this for my, um, Christmas card maybe this year. And then all you do is you basically go around it. So I decided that I was going to do
the green first. Um, uh, so I just go around and I'm putting the gonna put the green on two sides. And then I'm putting my second color pat or my second pattern on the other side. So hold on a second and I'll show you when they're set up. I just realized not only does it have to go, but it also has to be glued enough that I can show it to you in a vertical position. So here you go, just go like that. And then the next set creates kind of that sawtooth design. So I have to kind of think about it for a second to make sure I'm doing it right. So basically for the next set of uh, papers, what you want to show or what you want to make sure you're doing is that you have a right angle. Now, unfortunately, somebody can stop me and correct me if I'm wrong, because unfortunately I can't go back to my computer screen to look at it. So I'm taking an educated guess on it. And it goes like this, okay? So then I'll do the next ones. Danny, <clears throat> you guys are gonna share, I'll do the spotlight on you. Oh, there you There's go, Lori's one. sharing. And then Jenny, can you guys hold yours up again? That was- so Oh yeah, I would love to see them. <clears throat> you could just hold it. I saw you holding it up before. Yeah. Let's see. Oh yeah. And I I have to say So hold on Lynn. I I had a Jenny know. spotlight. Okay Lynn, go ahead and spotlight. I spotlighted you. Oh, oh nice. that's gorgeous. Look at that. Yeah. That's really nice. Yeah. Oh wow. I didn't that's really beautiful. know we were going to uh do this. So anyway, I had this other thing planned. Can you see that? That looks great. Oh, that's beautiful. I'll cut it to oh, and put it in my art too. journal. Oh, well, and that, you know what that really kind of channels for me is not just the quilting, but it reminds me a little bit of the ledger drawing too, with you know, all those different elements on it. We were on a Navajo Nation when that picture was taken. Oh, and, and uh, I just heard that uh, my daughters were on a Navajo Nation when this picture was taken. Oh my goodness. Cool. I mean, not Navajo. Nation yeah. reservation. Reservations. Yeah. That's yeah, very special. Totally me. Yeah, a couple weeks totally ago, and um, just outside of Flagstaff, Arizona. Super yeah. special. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to keep on going with mine. I'd rather see yours. But basically, <laughs> what you can do is you can fill this in. One of the things that I noticed too on it is uh, you, you fill it in, of course. Oh, I didn't put in my background color. So I'll do one more layer. Um, Cause I, I kind of felt like when I was doing it and the same thing that I saw with yours, I think the more patterns, the better. I think I liked that effect more than anything else. Um, so that's why I kind of switched mine from my earliest version. But the other thing I noticed too, is that um, the squares, there's quite a few squares and in some of the renditions, they basically, it's not very good. It was just a square rather than the triangle at the end. But um, basically I have this linear program, uh, linear uh, piece to finish up the corners basically. But again, I think your artwork probably puts mine to shame. So I don't wanna spend too much on that, but hopefully you can see how access um, accessible it is to do a project like this. And then here is my picture with our Yelp, my kids at Yellowstone here in the middle. So there you go. Kind of still a work in progress. Maybe I can get one of my kids to finish it for me. <laughs> Any other questions from anybody or comments on the artists? Anybody else want to show off their work? I do have a comment. I think uh, Wendy Redstar has a maid and three assistants. <laughs> everything that needs to be done. Yeah. Just to be a human in this society. 
<laughs> and then she has all the other time to create. I really, she, like I said, she's really quite prolific, like so many different areas. But again, what I think is really impressive is how she managed to keep up that pace, even during COVID, you know, in terms of her shows and her output. Um, and then starting at such a young age, like I still think that, you know, it's incredible that some of her most iconic pieces came right after she got out of graduate school. She must have been a handful in school. That's all I can say. <laughs> In fact, I, I think do, I said she made a comment about that. I do wonder how much her social media uh, presence mm -hmm. has impacted her fame. So there's a, a lot of Native artists out there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that uh, deserve attention. They're doing such amazing, mm -hmm. profound art. and. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing now they need to have that to get out there, that yeah. social media savvy. I think so, or more interactive works too. Like what I think about with Wendy Redstar, she's very good on the social media. And then her works, um, people can respond to her work. So they like the idea of photograph and text, you know, where you, because she's basically spelling it out for you in terms of kind of what she's trying to revise. You don't have to have any prior research or anything else. So for that, that work, which is one of her most popular, and that's like the one that you see in smart history and in textbooks is because it is so accessible for people. One of the other things that I see with a lot of uh, Native American artists today is um, more activist groups. So uh, Christy Belcourt, I think is in popularity, at least with my students that I've had over the past few years is another artist that's been very popular. She also comes from a beading tradition. She's Canadian First Nations, Métis. Mm -hmm. They have a really strong beading um, uh, uh, beating aesthetic as well. And so she actually does not, I've never seen any of her, I think just tiny little beaded items, but she paints images of really elaborate beading designs. Um, but more importantly, she is the one that started the Walking With Our Sisters project. So this was an activist project where she invited people, um, family members of missing and murdered indigenous women in Canada to send in moccasin tops for to commemorate their daughter. And so she's got like over 1500 different moccasin vamps now. And so it's it's similar to the AIDS quilt. Um, it's an interactive <coughs> project that gets huge crowds wherever it shows in Canada. And um, you know it, it's got that interactivity and that engagement that you see a lot of people respond to. So she's one of the other artists um, that a lot of people respond to, I think for that reason that, yeah, I have a lot of students that are really um, interested in the missing and murdered indigenous women's movement for good reason, because 50% of us are women. And, um, and so that's one of the, that's one of the points of engagement for a lot of people too. Yeah, that's fascinating. I'll have to take a look at um, her body of work to see exactly how many of them are interactive, because that's a good note for those of you out there who are trying to amp up your careers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. And another good artist to know if you ever wanna do that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, hey, how about we do this? Uh, go ahead and finish up. Could you send a picture of your finished piece, please, to me, email it to me, and then I will share it with our little group. Oh, How's and I'll make thing? sure to finish mine so you can see it too. Yes, please. Yosemite. I did not recognize Anna there. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Yeah, it was a long time ago. Actually, like I said, my youngest doesn't even remember ever having been there. Like being the youngest, <laughs> being the youngest there's many places he doesn't remember ever being. <laughs> well, thank you so much, then. everybody. Frida, have a great, um, I, I hope you're enjoying making these. Hi, Karen. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And email me your finished and then we'll share. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Yeah. Enjoy thank the you. weekend, everyone. You too. Bye bye. I or made a big mess. Tomorrow. <laughs> okay, that's it. Let's, let's leave it. Okay, thank you, Emma, so much.